Ed Lover, what up? What's up, Mr. Sean Press? How are you, sir? I'm great. I'm great. Ed, like, this, this is an interview I was looking forward to. It, it's a lot of us who worked in this industry, but it's those rare occasions where you have a chance to sit and talk to someone who was really a part of laying down the groundwork for everything that so many millions of people enjoy in hip hop, and you're one of those people. So I'm honored. Thank you, brother. As I sit here. Thank you, but I, I I'd be remiss if I didn't salute the people that came before me. So you know, there's a lot of people that came before me. I guess I just just happened to come along at the right time. I don't know. Um, definitely, you came along at the right time, and you did a lot for so many people. So you know, just to sit and hear your story is going to be my pleasure. Just know that. Ed, a lot of us know you for Queens, coming up in Queens, but you're originally from Brooklyn, is that correct? Yeah, I was born in Brooklyn. I was born in, I was born in Cumberland Hospital, and then we bounced around Brooklyn a lot from, I guess, from the age of one to about six. We bounced around Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy, Brownsville, different parts of Brooklyn that my parents lived in, you know, while they really kind of got themselves together. And then uh, I can remember as a kid, my mom going to night school to get her high school diploma while my dad worked. And, you know, I just remember one day we was packing up a lot of our stuff, man, and we was getting out of Brooklyn and we was, we was going to our own house. Because that was <laughs> a big thing for us was, you know, actually my parents owning a home because up until then we always lived in apartments. Everything was an apartment. It was an apartment here, it was an apartment there. I remember we had one apartment in like this brownstone building where the actual bathroom was down the hallway from the actual apartment that we had to use. And then we had another one I remember was next to a burnt out building. And that's when my older brother got bit by a rat. I remember that. And it was just like a, moving from Brooklyn into Queens was a whole totally different atmosphere. It was just a whole different way of life. Mm. How many siblings you have? I got two older brothers and a younger sister. Anybody else in hip hop? No. No, my sister, so used to, my sister used to work at Def Jam. My sister was at the front desk of Def Jam for a lot of years. So a lot of people know my sister as Sonya Knuckles because she was at that front desk of Def Jam for a long time. But my older brothers, no. My, my oldest, the brother right before me is a certified public accountant. accountant. My oldest brother is a, a retired New York City police officer. So Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm the only one. Got you. What part of Queens did you did y'all move to? We was in Queens Village, which uh, Clue and Envy are from, and Rockwilder, and they used to dub it Shadyville. I don't know why they started. I guess they wanted to be tough, you know, by calling it Shadyville. But mm -hmm. that's where we. That's where I came from. That's right next to Hollis, so we kind of claimed Hollis and in between Cambria Heights and Laurelton and Corona. And you, you, when you was from Queens, you moved all around Queens. So. You know, that's where I'm from, where LL is from, where Tribe is from, where Run DMC is from, where 50 Cent is from. 50 from the south side. I'm from the north side. It's, it's all the same thing. Before really getting into the game, did you ever used to see any of these guys in the neighborhood? Oh, or yeah, even oh absolutely. Knowing? Absolutely, all the time. Because I, I started out as a DJ. So I knew Jam Master J from a group that he had, he was in called Two Fifth Down. I knew Davy D because Davy D has solo sound, and I was in a group called Master Sound. So you you know you saw everybody. If you was rocking in the park, you saw Run and D come in the park and jump on the mic. You saw LL come from farmer side of things and jump on the mic. You saw you saw all Salt and Pepper and Kid and Play and Herbie come over our side and us going over their side because they had a park jam or a block party. So you saw them all the time, and even after the fame, they were still come. They were still in the neighborhood. So. You get to sell everybody, man. I got to meet Sweet Tea and before she made records and, and Salt and Pepper and Martin Lawrence and just a little bit about everybody. You know, Eric B. And you knew Eric B. You knew because he was from a different side, more the Corona side. And then he was with Molly for a while. So it was kind of like this thing was just going around and everybody knew everybody, man. And I was in a band, too. I didn't, I didn't mention that. I was in a band, too, so. Yeah, talk talk to me about that because I know before you really was doing the hip hop thing, you you was in a funk band. Correct? I was in a funk band for a long time, bro. From the time I was like fourteen until probably all the way up to MTV, I, I was in a funk band. The first name, the name of the group originally was Oasis Two, 
That was the name of the group. And then we changed the name of the group from Oasis 2 to the Function Freaks. And then that spun into when everybody kind of started falling by the wayside and doing their own thing and not really believing in what we were trying to do anymore. It kind of just melted down from at one point like 11 piece band to three of us. And that's how we created No Face. And then No Face came from all of that. And then No Face got the record deal with Rush Associated Labels and you know, we just kept moving. Everybody just kept moving all the time. But that funk band happened for a long time, man. Some of the toughest young dudes in that area, we like 14, 15, 13, you know, just playing music, man, and loving loving funk music. And I split my time between that and my love of hip hop and trying to be an MC at the same time. So what instrument did you play? I played trumpet. I played trumpet for a mm. long time. Wow. Wow. So so I know when you were really, you know, doing the hip hop thing in the early stage, do you remember your first name that you went by? Yeah, absolutely. MC Eddie D. Everybody had a D. <laughs> Everybody had to have a D. Yeah. MC Eddie D, bro. Eddie D and the MC crew. Because I looked up the cats that the, those tapes that used to come around from all over everywhere, man. And I looked up the cats like, you know, you hear Curtis Blow on the tape and the Cold Crush Brothers and the Furious Five, all that stuff came to us via tape before there was even any rap on the record. The first rap I ever heard on the record was Personality Jock by King Tim the Third, And then not too long after that, Rapper's Delight came out. But you know, everybody had that like, uh, uh, there was Woody Wood and, and there was Sonny, uh, Eddie Chiba. And he used to have all the girls going, Chiba, Chiba, Chiba. So I was like, yo, I got it. That call and response was everything. I heard DJ Hollywood on tape, and all that call and response was what I was doing as an MC, just mimicking whatever I heard everybody else say, and all the throw your hands up in the air, and then I had my MC crew and my sister, and her, her girls wore the sweatshirts at MC crew, and I'd yell something out, MC crew, what you got for me? They yelled back two turntables and a deaf MC. So we was doing stuff like that, man. That, that was my really beginnings of loving hip hop, and that all came from them tapes that came from Harlem in the Bronx. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You, you, you know, everybody knows you from being the host of Yo! MTV Raps. Is it true that Ted Demi is an old family friend of yours? Yeah, I know Ted Demi since high school, bro. Uh, Ted Demi, yeah? my connection to Ted Demi is a funny story because Ted Demi went to church, an Episcopalian church, his father was very high in the church. My, my best friend, Kurt Flirt, his mother was very high in the church. So to calm Kurt down when something was happening, like a retreat or something like that, she always said, well, bring Ed with you, right? Because I don't want you to be bored. So I would go be with Kurt family on his Episcopalian religious retreats. And that's where we met this white boy whose father, who, who named Ted. And that relationship kept on even when we weren't in church things, Ted had his friends in Rockville Center. We were right there in Queens, wasn't too far. If somebody had a car, we can get to Rockville Center or take and get his parents' car, come to us. So what we started doing is all these little competitions between my block and Ted's block. So Ted and them love football, we love football. So we'd pile in my boy car, go to Ted block, play them in football. Ted and them will come our way and then we and play us on our side of town and football. And people are like, what are all these white boys doing around here? I'm like, yo, that's my man in them. Don't worry about it. We got the football game <laughs> going on. So we did that back and forth all the way through college. When Ted went to college, then they used to have the court. He went to Cortland State. So Cortland State would have these big picnics. Ted used to work in this bar as a bartender and a DJ. And we would drive all the way up to Cortland just to hang out with Ted and his crew. And then after college, Ted got on MTV, created your MTV raps with Peter Doherty. They had Fab Five Freddy. You get to Yo MTV Raps, which was the first national hip hop show ever in America. Yeah. And which is how I got introduced to Fab Five Freddy, where you basically gave the first interviews to damn near every hip hop legend. Yeah, at that time it was amazing. Um I had there was a guy by the name of Peter Darty and Ted Demi, two guys that worked at MTV. Um, were very big into rap, aware of this movement growing, developing, record selling, going gold, platinum with no 
marketing, no video, no nothing, just on the word of mouth, on the strength of the force of the culture. And they campaigned and lobbied MTV to like do something. And um, these guys, especially Peter Darty, they knew that I had made all these connections downtown, was tight with people in the band Blondie. I mean, I'm featured in their video. They shouted me out on that record, Rapture. They said, listen, man, he's the guy. And I was shocked when they called me because it was in 1988 and I had just directed the first music video I did, which was my philosophy for an artist by the name of KRS-One. And um, I made this video as strong and as black as the lyrics and the content of the record de demanded, never thinking, people were like, yo, do you think this is gonna be on MTV? I'm like, B, I'm sure this will never be on MTV because I'm putting this thing down in the proper format. And uh, next thing you know, uh, I got this call to host the show. You know, they did a little screen test, they loved it. And on the very first show, I played my philosophy. And I, I was like, this is really felt like change is, change is about to come, a change is gonna come. And it and the change came. And the show had the highest ratings in MTV history right out the box. I started bugging Ted about being on the show because of my love of hip hop and my knowledge of hip hop. I wanted to do a record review, a movie review, whatever I could do to be a part of Fab Show, I wanted to do it. So when MTV decided they wanted to do a daily show, Fab decided that he didn't want to be on TV every day. Because, you know, Fab's an artsy dude, man. Fab is downtown. Fab is with Basquiat. Fab is doing all kind of directing and all that. He didn't want to be bogged down to a daily show. They had to find somebody. Peter knew Dre. Ted knew me. We both auditioned along with everybody else that auditioned. And Ted had the foresight to see tall, skinny Ed, short, fat Dre, Abner Costello, put them together for the Daily Show. That was Ted's foresight, Ted and Peter. God, God rest both their souls. So you met Dre literally at the audition. You yeah. Because he's from Queens as well, correct? Dre is from Long Island. That's different. Dre's from Westbury. You can get to Brooklyn faster than you can get to Westbury. Mm -hmm. So Dre's out there in Long Island. So... I knew about Dre because he was on BAU. I knew who Dre, I knew about him. I never met him, I didn't know anything about him. I knew about him because sometimes we used to listen to BAU. You know, you had the box and you had to move that antenna around, try to get BAU because it's out, out of college in Long Island and we could get Dre's operating room and everything else that they was doing and you know, listening in the early stages of Chuck D and Flavor Flav on the radio. Because hip hop wasn't really mainstream on the radio like that. It's when we listened to Stretch and Bobito the same way and whoever else was on. So I knew who Dre was, I knew about him, but I never met him. I actually met him at the audition for Your TV Rap. Did y'all get along right away? We got along from there... the we got along from the rip. From yeah? from yeah, it was it was like it was natural. We got along from day one, just automatically. Soon as Ted put us both on film together and I vibed off of Dre. And we vibed off of each other. I just knew it. I was like, yeah, there's, I could work with this dude, like for real. Did you automatically know that y'all had something special on your hand? This was going to be a daily show. I'm with a guy I got instant chem chemistry with. I, I feel like we on to something big. I don't think we knew that probably until we went to an hour. Because when we were on, at first, we were only on for half an hour. And I... If I'm not mistaken, I would have to go back and look at the shows. I think you only saw Dre and I on camera twice. And the rest of it was voiceover. So we didn't know. We just thought, hey, listen, MTV got this thing going with your MTV Raps. It's the daily show. We knew Fab was being successful on the weekends, but we were just stuck in the studio. We didn't even have a lot of guests come through at that time. We were just showing the videos from, like, this little corner in the MTV studio, so we didn't know, man. We didn't know. I think when it got to become an hour and we were f five days a week and at some point we were twice a day, I think that's when we knew we was on to something special. Do you know what made them turn it into an hour show? It was successful. It was, it was extremely successful from the rip. You know, from, from the time people turned that on, it was successful. It was something that hip-hop was building and bubbling at that time and becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. 
It was just something that people, you know, people that was into the music and hip hop was starting to sell a lot of records. People that was into the music, well, before us, because you got to remember, Curtis Blow sold a million copies of The Breaks. So mm -hmm. there was a market for it. I just think everybody was afraid to tap that market. And once there was a way to get, look at videos on television without, you know, big up to Ralph McDaniels and Video Music Box, they were before us. But for that MTV audience, the audience of suburban black and white kids were mostly white kids that didn't have access to hip hop videos. Once they got a taste of that, it was over with, bro. Yeah, and definitely shout out to to Ralph and Video Music Box. Absolutely. He, he's absolutely a pioneer and really introduced so many of the new artists. Yeah, especially um, to so many of us. For us on for us on the Eastern Seaboard, yeah, that's what we watch. Before, you know, before the box. You know, every different city in this country had local shows. Some of them did, some of them didn't that show videos. But the thing with Young TV Raps is we touched places nobody else could touch. You know what I mean? Wasn't wasn't Yo MT Raps MTV Raps global? Yeah. At the time, it's a, this wasn't just a new uh, uh, mm -mm. Uh, national show. No, this was around the uh, globe. Yeah, yeah. Sophie Bromwell is a young lady out of England. They had a show called Yo, and at one time Peter was on in, in, uh, in charge of that show in England. When he came back to MTV in New York, Ted got at him and was like, "Yo, we need to do a hip hop show." And he was like, "Well, Sophie got a show where." It's very eclectic. It wasn't just hip hop. It was dance. It was whatever it is. And it's just called Yo. And Ted was like, Yo, MTV, raps. We were all rap. We weren't so much dance or uh, anything else like that. Unless, you know, it was Queen Latifah or something like that would dance with me. But we were a hip hop show, a rap video show. Got you. So for the first two, two, two and a half years of the show, were y'all under contract at this point? No, not at all. No, we, so didn't, we you, didn't have a contract. Literally... We, had, we had, we were like employees, man. We didn't, we didn't have a contract. That first, that first look for us was, MTV got a thousand dollars a week. You guys got to split it, and it was like, okay, you know, extra five hundred dollars with with my salary. I was a school security officer at Andrew Jackson High School in Queens. I kept that job, bro. So hold on. Let me make sure I'm understanding this. While you're hosting one of the most popular, iconic video shows in pop culture, you're still working as a school security guard? Yeah, because I worked for the city of New York. I had no contract. There was no contract with MTV. So we, there was no guaranteed money. So MTV could come any day and go, okay, you know what, guys, that was great, but uh, we're thinking about moving in a different direction or we're going to replace you guys with somebody else, and then I'm out. So I'm like, look, I'm making a decent amount of money over here. I could keep doing this and get this $500 a week from MTV. That, that's what I'm going to do. And we only shot your MTV raps in one day. So it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like a crazy day. I think I got off at 4.30. Um, at the time, and we had to shoot MTV like sometimes at 3.30. So my, my, my group leader, what they call it, because it was like 19 of us security, she like, hey, go ahead, I'll punch you out. You know what I mean? So don't worry about it. So she let me breathe. I breathe, go down to MTV, and we would shoot your know, MTV raps. We shot all five shows in one day because we never sat there and looked at the videos. We didn't see the videos. We didn't see the finished product till later. You know what I mean? So all it was was, hey, this is the next video. Whatever you guys are doing, make sure you hit the video. And sometimes if you look at them, I would forget the video and, and ask, like, yo, what's the video? And somebody would yell it out, and then we would go to it. So the early days of Young TV Raps, just them half an hour shows, it didn't take that long. Dre and I would change our clothes behind the set and then come out, and hey, you know, welcome to Young TV Raps. It's exercise day or whatever day we was doing, or it's food day in them early half an hour yo we got this coming up we got that coming up but right now as we get our exercise on his snoop dog with dr dre with nothing but a g thing on your own tv raps and then that was it and then you bang those out next day bang those out next day bang those out and you're done yeah what was it like going back to school i know for you you're like okay i could go and i can knock this out in one day but you're going back to high school I'm going Those back kids to a high had to recognize you. I'm going back to a high school on the side of 
Queens where not a lot of people had MTV. So it may be one or two students caught it like, yo, I just saw you on this rap joint. That, yo, you doing that? I'm like, yeah, it's called your MTV Raps. And it's like, yeah. And then slowly MTV started coming into the neighborhood. But once it got into the neighborhood, it was, man, <laughs> I could I could work there no more, man. <laughs> yeah, they had to be out of control. Yeah, it was I mean, out of control. It, it was at a point where I just, it was time for me to leave it. Got you. How'd y'all wind up getting your contract eventually? Like, um, what, what made we, them finally put y'all under contract? We were we were we were asking for a contract um, for a while. You know, Dre had a better relationship with Russell Simmons than I did. I knew Russell because I knew Russell was from around my way, and I knew Russell and I went to the same high school, but at different times. So Dre had been in working with Run DMC, working with Beastie Boys, you know, being there toward DJ. He understood that we needed to be a united front and we needed management. So we went with Rush Associated Label, Rush Associated Management it was Rush. Who we rolling with? We rolling with Rush. Everybody was with Rush. So we went with Rush. And uh, Russell brought Lior in and had Lior go in and talk to MTV about a contract. And Lior went in and did his magic and we got paid. <laughs> Do you remember what that first paycheck looked like? I know we went from five hundred dollars a week to a quarter million dollars a year. Ooh. I know that. I know I made more money than my parents made together. Was there any favorite interviews that you had during those days? Because you were Man, doing hip hop's golden me, era. I think for me, was one was having people on there, man, that sometimes are outside of the box of hip hop. Like the, when the time we did, we did a week worth of shows with Bill Cosby at the height of the Cosby show. Now I know all of these things with Bill Cosby now is different and make people look at him different, but there was a time when Bill Cosby was the everything, you know? And having him come down to do a week worth of your TV raps was incredible because he actually called me at home, he called MTV looking for me, and they called me at home and said, hey, man, somebody from the Cosby Show called you, say Bill Cosby is looking for you. Here's the number. You should call him back. This is the number one show in the world on network television at the time. I'm calling back to uh, Bill Cosby's office, and I remember in my head, Eddie Murphy, I don't know if it was from Raw or if it was from Delirious, he said Bill Cosby only calls you for two reasons. He either calls you to tell you that you can't say all oh, that filth, flown and filth, filth, you know, that, <laughs> or he's calling you to praise you and tell you that he likes the work that you're doing. So I'm scared to death. I'm like, what the hell is Bill Cosby calling me for? So I call him back and his assistant picks up the phone. I say, hey, this is Ed Lover from MTV. Uh, somebody told me that Bill Cosby is looking for me. And she goes, yeah, Ed, hold on. Mr. Cosby want to talk to you. And I'm like, oh, no way. It's, Bill Cosby getting on the phone with me. And he picks up the phone. He goes, hey, Ed, Bill Cosby here, man. I'm like, I'm like, hey, Mr. Cosby, how you doing? He's like, no, no, Mr. Cosby, you call me Bill. And I'm like, this is I come, man. I watched Fat Albert as a kid. I watched I Spy as a kid. I know the Jell-O pudding commercials. Like, this dude is an icon, and we rushing home to watch the Cosby show every week. So he goes on to tell me that he was, his daughter put him on, to you on TV Raps, he had it on in his office, and he's watching the show, and he's, I seen you and you was doing this character, man, and he had this hat on and these glasses. I said, yeah, Perry J. Perry Winkle III. He's like, man, I saw that thing, and I was just cracking up, man. I'm telling you, my kids love the show. I want to come down there and do that show. Can you make it happen? And we made it happen, and we shot a week worth of shows right around Christmas time with Bill Cosby. We shot a week worth of shows with the incomparable godfather of hip-hop himself, James Brown. I mean... Who has sampled Funky Drummer more than anybody else? MTV tried to get Bobby Brown to do something at the time when Bobby Brown was on top of the world. Ten million sold, man. He's the king of everything. I run into Bobby. Bobby's my man. We get Bobby to come down and do the show, but he won't do nothing else for MTV. And they wondering, how the hell, how the hell he get Bobby Brown? It was just those connections of people that watched the MTV raps. It's, it's watching Leaders of the New School blossom. It's watching Tribe blossom. It's having Tupac come on and talk about the mess with the Hughes brothers, with John Singleton when they were promoting 
um, poetic justice. It's those things. It's, it's the live Fridays and Tupac and God rest his soul, my man Stretch doing Holler If You Hear Me and Red Man and, and Public Enemy. It's, it's, it's all of that, man. It's just, it's all of that. You, you know, y'all had so many people on that show. Was there, was it always all love or was there ever any drama behind the scenes? It was always all love. I think the only time that we that we laugh about it now is Wu Tang Clan came on for the first time. It wasn't like no drama, but they weren't they were not happy with me because I didn't understand that they were so serious about everything. And I came out in this karate gi and all this stuff on. I called myself uh, Master Wu, and hell, the looks on their faces. When they was there, I remember Meth told me, Meth was like, yo, man, we was not happy with that, that what you was doing, bro. <laughs> and they know I'm joking around, I'm doing your own TV raps. I'm, I'm being funny. And they just were not happy with it. But later on, you know, as you go on, they were happy just to be on the show and they loosened up and they started laughing and stuff like that. But at first, mm -mm, they wasn't happy. You know, another thing, there was this episode, I think you was in Compton. And Easy whispered in your ear, and then it was rumored you slapped Easy. Is there any truth to any of this? And what did he no, whisper in your bro, ear? No, bro, that is so untrue. Let me tell you what happened. Me and my man Stretch, God rest his soul. We used to we used to put each other and Todd one. Todd one, God rest Todd soul also. Todd was working on the show as a producer, and we used to do this thing to each other where we would say we gonna put each other in the smash, right? So that means you put your hand on somebody's head like this, and you push their head all the way over, like, yeah, what you talking about? So Stretch was so big, he was like six eight, six nine. Stretch used to put me in the smash and rifle through my pockets and throw all my stuff on the floor. It was just like a running joke that we had between each other. So we were doing it with EZ, Dre, Cube was already gone, and I was like, yo, easy, come on, man. We got to make this move, man. Just stop playing around. I put my hand on his head and I put him in the smash. Now, that was the same weekend that we were going to do the whole thing from Easy es Wet and Wild uh, pool party. And he just whispered it in my ear and I just played it off like he said something threateningly. But Easy wasn't that kind of dude, man. Easy was a fun loving, happy go lucky, love making money, love being out of the drug game. Didn't want to go back to the street life drug game. He was happy making money and living his life with NWA. Easy never threatened me. And what he whispered in my ear, I will never tell anybody. But it did had nothing to do with a threat or anything else. That's just between me and Easy. Dre don't even know what Easy said in my ear. And it was hilarious, but I will never tell anybody. That was so, never. So you Let really me tell you remember. Something. Easy was my dude. Easy took us to Compton Swap Me the first time. We went to Compton Swap Meet. We in a swap meet, and I got the wrong colors on for the wrong neighborhood. And Easy pulled me to the side. He said, yo, man, we're going to have to get you something different to wear because that color ain't the color for around here. And he was like, it ain't me, and it ain't one of the OGs that'll do something to you. It's one of them little hungry shorties trying to make their name for themselves by doing something to you. So he bought me a windbreaker, man, that had my name on it. Well, come on, man. Easy was my man, yo. Come on. Stop that. Yo, Ed, when you write your book, you gotta you gotta finally tell the world what Easy whispered in your ear. I will. It'll you can't, be in the you book. can't let that go it, to the I, grave. I ain't with gonna you. tell it. Man, I'll tell you, Easy E's wet and wild pool party, bro. Bro, it's straight out of Compton didn't even do it any justice whatsoever. Easy E took a, 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 a page out of the Luke Skywalker book on how to get his records played and how to get his videos played, bro. When I tell you he said he set the ladies out. Woo! Mm. That's something I'm gonna have to answer to at the gates of heaven for that one, bro. <laughs> let me let me ask you: Do you remember the Ed Lover dance? The Ed Lover dance was invented by T Money. I cannot not. T Money invented that T -Money dance. T Money invented the Ed Lover dance, bro. T Money was doing it, and I jumped on with T Money one day while he was doing it, popping the hips and stuff like that. And T said, "Yo, Ed, that's dope, man. You should do that. You should do that, man, as as your own dance." And I was like, yeah, man, I'm going to do it, but I'm, I'm only doing it once. And T was like, nah, in order for this to catch on, you got to pick a day of the week and you got to do it every week. We can make it funny. You can do it different places. You can have other people doing it. You can come up with different ways of doing it. And we picked Wednesday because it was hump day. Really wasn't too much happening on a Wednesday. We had live Fridays. So we really didn't have nothing for the uh, middle of the week. Dre started playing that 900 number. 
by Mark the 45 King and I, T started doing it and I started doing it with T and it just became the Ed Lover dance and then they were flashing on the screen. You know, everybody knew on Wednesdays was I was going to do the dance. They didn't know when, they didn't know how. I remember one time I said I was doing it underwater. I pulled out an umbrella, Dre stood on the chair and poured water on top of it and I started doing it. It was the Ed Lover underwater dance. I did it with Bobby Brown. Man, the, one of the highlights of my life is the fact that James Brown did the Ed Lover dance with me, man. So it was like, everybody that would come on, if you was there on a Wednesday, you was going to do the Ed Lover dance. I know you ain't did the Ed Lover dance in years, but before you leave the studio, we need you to give a one time only Ed Lover dance. <laughs> All right, I got you, bro. I got you, I hit that for you real quick in the chair, in the chair, Ed Lover dance. Yo, you know what's That's ill about that, bro? I, I swear, if I go somewhere, and that song come on, and somebody is in there in, in our age group, they always turn around and look at me like, come on, Ed, you got to hit they that one time for us, bro. They got to. That da na 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 They got to. That, as soon as that Mark the 45 King, when that drop, it's synonymous yeah, with Ed Lover and that dance. Yeah, South the DJ Cool took that and made a hit record out of it. Absolutely. Um, you spoke about your rap group No Face earlier. I want to go back to that for a second because No Face had a deal at Def Jam right around in the same time that you're doing Yo! and TV raps, correct? Yeah. Wasn't there some kind of, I don't know if it was a discrepancy where MTV raps did, or the, or the upper management of MTV didn't want you being associated with the group for some odd reason? Yeah. No Face. When, when, no, let me tell you how No Face came about, first of all. From us being in the band, to the band breaking up, um, to it literally becoming me, Mark, and Shy left around still trying to do whatever we wanted to do. We are in the studio working on the funk music, and Mark was like, yo, dude, we need to, you know, you always doing them parodies, man. We need to record one of them parodies and put it out. So we did, I took the Jungle Brothers, Girl, I House You, and rewrote it into a song we call Hump Music. So we redid the Jungle Brothers, Girl, I House You, changing it to Girl, I Hump You. And then when we got to the last part of the song, it became even nastier than that. So we want to put it out on, on um, popular records, but we were like in 4th and Broadway. And um, it was like, who we gonna, what are we going to put out? What's going to be the name of the group? And it was just us three that were on the record. So one of us said, yo, we ain't got no face in this, in this industry. It doesn't matter what we call ourselves. And then somebody, I think it was Mark that said, yo, let's call ourselves No Face. And that's how No Face came about because I was on MTV at the time. We put that record out. That record did some damage in the clubs because it was, you know, Hip House was popping at, at that time. You know, Jungle Brothers mm -hmm. had Girl I House You, Queen Latifah had Coming to My House, KY's had... Stomp, yeah, that's the idea. You know, every, Doug Lazy with Let It Roll, um, KC Flight was doing his thing with Planet E. So we just put the record out there and we start getting gigs as this group called No Face. So we were like, all right, how do we surprise people because Ed is on MTV and he has this group. And one of us came up with the idea of us wearing ski masks. So we don't have a face, so you shouldn't see who No Face is. So we had ski mask on. We had two strippers come out wearing pasties and they would strip and dance while we performed the song. And then we would perform another song right after that. I think it was Fake Hair Wearing Bitch. It was the other single that we had that we were trying to promote. And then at the end of the show, right before we went off stage, we would pull our mask off. And then people would be like, oh shit, that's Ed Lover, right? And then we would dash. So we did that for a while, man. And then, you know, we started making noise. We got to deal with Rush Associated Labels. Russell had No Face Records. Uh, he had JMJ Records. That's where Onyx and all of that came out, where 50 was early signed. And there's a few other, uh, other labels that Russell had. I guess Columbia gave him a deal and said, hey, you could take these labels and we'll, we'll put music out. So we had that going on. At the same time, we signed BWP, which was our female version of NWA. We were the New York version of the two live crew. That's what No Face was. The whole album was called Under the Staircase. We had songs on there like, the, no, the album was called Wake Your Daughter Up. So we took the Parliament's uh, We Wanna Funk and changed that to We Wanna Fuck, Wake Your Daughter Up. 
So that was our version. We, we just, we was wilding. Fake hair wearing bitch was on there because Weeze was going crazy at the time. So we was just wilding. So there was a moral clause in my contract that MTV exercised. So at the time, I'm in a group. We got a regional hit record. We got a label. And here come MTV telling me, you got to choose this or you got to choose that. Now, here's an important fact about Dre and I and MTV a lot of people don't know. And Ted and Fab. We programmed your MTV raps. All they did was clear the videos. The video had to clear, and then we would say what we were playing and when we were playing it. So if my group has a label and we're putting out videos on artists, and I'm on the number one show on cable TV, isn't it best for me to say, you guys continue, I'm going to stay here, and whenever we as a label put out stuff, I'm programming it. And them dudes mm. are like two of the closest dudes to my heart to this day, man. And that's, that's what it was. MTV came to me and told me morally I couldn't put out that kind of music. Later on, you know, Donnie Wahlberg is my dude and everything, but once... I don't understand how his wife, Jenny McCarthy, was able to go from Playboy magazine and let it all loose in Playboy and still be on MTV, but I couldn't say mm -hmm. fake hair wearing bitch. It's got to be something in there between the races. You know what I mean? So how's she not Absolutely. breaking the moral clause, but I'm breaking the moral clause. I don't get it. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and speaking of moral, uh, you were on stage during in, in Detroit, if I can remember. Yeah, correct, yes, sir. When 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 NWA that that infamous f the police. Do do you remember that? Absolutely, day? bro. Dre and I and uh, hosted that that concert. That's the first time I knew we were big. For me, I don't know Go about ahead. Dre. Dre might tell a different story, but for me, that's the first time that I knew we were big because I was like, yo, why do they have us? Um, hosting this concert, ain't nobody know us. Like, we in Detroit. I don't really think Detroit got MTV like that, not knowing that they did. And getting the screams that we got when they was like, the, you know, the guy over the loudspeaker was like, and here's your host for tonight's show from your own TV raps, Dr. Dre and that lover. And when we walked out, I was nervous as hell. And it was like, they lost it, bro. They was like, oh, my God. And I was like, yo, dog, people in Detroit know us. People got to know who we are. Like, this show is really making some noise in this country. And Detroit was the first place. So what I remember about that incident is they were not supposed to perform Fuck the Police. And the way they show it in the film is very similar to the way it went down, except Dre and I and T watched the police from the audience. I was standing in the audience. I watched the police like the M80 and throw it on stage, and it blew up. And, and I think Drano thought somebody was shooting at them, so they ran off the stage, and the police chased them off the stage, and they was all in the back, and Easy was pissed because they weren't supposed to perform that shit, and they did it anyway. It was just like a whole lot. It was a lot going on at that time, but I remember being there when I went down. You said Easy was pissed. Easy was pissed. E Easy didn't want to perform that night? Easy hadn't He didn't want to perform yet. that song? In w Easy was bigger than NWA at that time. Mm. Easy, was, Easy hadn't come out yet. They would do their songs first that were just starting to bubble off of uh, NWA and the Boys album. Straight Outta Compton wasn't even out yet. And Easy was that dude. Because they had, you know, uh, the song Everybody Like Now by Easy E, his solo song. The Boys in the Hood, you know, The Boys in the Hood is yep, always yep. hard. That mm -hmm. was out. Uh, Easy Does It was coming out. We Want Easy was coming out. Easy was the dude first, and then NWA came after Easy. So Easy was waiting backstage. He was supposed to come out, and they, well, they had already told the people that put the concert on that they would not do Fuck the Police, and they did it. Well, Straight Outta Compton had been out, but they did that song, and Easy had not come onto the stage yet to do his solo stuff. Wow. Something I didn't realize. Y'all really blew because it, it, now you, you're taking steps in other directions. Yes, yo is on the air from 89 to 95, but you have become such a global icon. Y'all got into movies.
Yeah. Um, it, 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 around 1993, you do the film, Who's the Man? How'd that come about? That came about from an idea that I came up with, but I don't know how to write scripts. So I came up with the idea. I took it to Dre. Dre and I sat down together, hashed the idea out, took it to our manager at the time, Charlie Stetler. Charlie ran with it, went to New Line. They attached Susan DePass onto it, got a screenwriter to write it. And uh, in 90, 91, 92, we start shooting this hip hop Who Done It called Who's the Man? The, really, the real undertones of Who's the Man was really about showing the regentrification of our neighborhoods. They, we, they, they added the oil onto it to kind of give it that funny feel to it. But, and I enjoyed that part of it too, uh, you know, finding oil in the hood. But it was really about how regentrification was starting to take place in Harlem. Because even back then you could see it, you know, little sprinklings of white people moving in and they're going to move in, make the neighborhood nice and make it unaffordable for black people to live there anymore. And if you go to Harlem today, you see it. Some parts of the South Bronx and some, you know, a lot of places are, are regentrified. And that's really, really what the movie was about, but what a comedic twist. And now let's add all the hip hoppers who are hot right now. Let's put this person in this role, salt and pepper and yo-yo and... KRS One and you know Bernie. It was, Mac. it was a ton of hip hop cameos in, yeah. in that film. You know, crisscross, all of that. Yeah. Let's talk about the final episode of um of Yo. What was that like for you? Because th th again, this is the golden era of hip hop. Y'all had interviewed so many people, so many people who would later go on to massive success. For you, was it heartbreaking when it came to to an end? What was that final episode like? Because we just spoke about who's the man, and it was a who's who of hip hop cameos. Yeah. But I remember that final episode of Yo MTV Raps. Everybody showed up. What was that like, filming that? It was fun, filming it, especially when you know everybody was going freestyle. And you knew that that was going to be a one in a, a once in a lifetime opportunity for, to have that many different people right behind each other freestyling. But it was sad because I really wanted to do 10 years. If I could have got 89 to 99, I'd have been happy. I really wanted Young know, TV Raps to, to be one of those shows that lasted 10 years. But to stand there on the set, once the once it started going and the energy and scribbles on the set and everybody's freestyling, man, you know, Keras one and Rakim and Surge and, and Meth and Red and everybody that grabbed that mic that day, man, you just standing there all like, wow, I can't, first of all, I can't believe this is the last show. And secondly, I can't believe that the the outpouring of love that we had from those MCs that came down and said, yeah, I'm we showing up for this last episode and we gonna grab the mic. You know what I mean? So it was crazy. Was, was So I asked you earlier, was there any drama on that set that day? Because I know at that time, Third Base and MC Hammer, they was going at it. Yeah, no And no they drama. both showed nobody, up. Nobody brought drama to Young TV Raps, bro. It was almost like the safe, the safe haven. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There, nah, nobody was, nobody was, we didn't even have, I don't even remember having security there. It was, it's love, bro. It was love of that show. Yeah, That's what they showed up for. Show. They showed up Icon to say goodbye to an iconic program. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously everybody knows you for that part of your life, but you played a major part. Like, you have relationships with so many people, but you had a very special relationship with Tupac. How, how did that relationship between you and Tupac even come into existence? That relationship came when I was asked to do a cameo in Juice. I had run, come across Pac before through my relationship with Digital Underground, but really didn't know Pac like that. Um, when I went down to shoot my stuff with Juice, I brought my man Stretch with me from Live Squad because at the time we were trying to find a deal for Live Squad. And, uh, you know, them dudes smoke weed, man. They smoke hella weed. <laughs> and <laughs> them two clicked. Um, and once they clicked, Stretch being my man, and we just all, every time we was together, it seemed like Pac clicked with him and clicked with me. 
And we would just, we always hang out. Whenever dude came to New York or whatever he was doing, you know, especially after Juice, it was like we was always with him or he was always on our block or he would always come around and, and check us out. Like we the people that he called when he touched down in New York. So you really like because if if I if I understand this right, wouldn't Pac be at your mom's crib? Like yeah. wasn't y'all because really? he'd be around the way. He'd be at Stretch's mom's crib, and then they would come if they came around to pick me up. Stretch had the MPV. If they came around to, sc to scrape me up, they would jump out. Pac go and hug mom, say what's up to moms. Moms would feed them. You know, sit down, be in the living room, have a conversations with moms because. You know, Pac was a revolutionary, man, and my mom's lived through that. So he would always ask my mom's questions about what did the Panthers mean when she was coming up, like, and being in New York at that time and what all of that meant and what was it like living her life when she can only drink from this water fountain and she couldn't look a white person in their eyes and, you know, being scared to go to certain places because you don't know how the police is going to treat you. Those are the things that he was interested in talking to my mom about all the time. So Pac was just... People look at Pac differently than I do because I was with Pac before the first album came out and nobody was really checking for him like that, that hard, you know, until really until uh, Brenda's Got a Baby came out. But Holla If You Hear Me and all those stuff and Soldier Story, some of my favorite records, people wasn't checking for Pac like that until later on. So the Pac that I know is just Pac on the rise. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Tretch, uh, him hanging out with Tretch at the time, 93, Tretch is a bigger star than Pac is. You know, I remember us getting on the train going to the Apollo to go see Naughty perform. And we standing in the back and people like, yo, Ed Lover, what's up? Oh, that's that dude Tupac, right? You know what mm. I mean? So it wasn't that frenzy. So it's everybody struggling at the same time. So you you busting down, you know what I mean? I, I was a bigger star than, than Pac at the time. But once he became a star, bro, it was over. It was over. It was over. It was over. And, and it's Crazy, you just mentioned y'all was on the train going up yeah, to the Yeah, you know, it was a hey, Ed Lover, hey, hey, Ed Lover. Oh, my God, they go to, you know, they go that guy from that movie Juice, you know? This is before Poetic Justice. This is before Death Row. This is before, you know, all, all, all the stuff. But once his star rose, man, it was over, bro. When he was down in Atlanta, he had the crib. We come down there, we, you know, we go to different... Jack the Rapper conventions and all that stuff together, man. I had to get the dude out of jail one time. It was crazy, bro. Just, just being with Pac, he's just a, he was just our friend. We didn't look at him like, ah. Uh, I guess it's the way Tata and them look at Jay Z. Like, that's just mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. Jay. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter what status he's at, that's that's our boy Jay, and that's how Pac was with us. That's my man Pac. Got you. What wasn't Pac? supposed to be in minister society yeah and that was the controversy with uh the hughes brothers because he said they fired him in some unpunk punk ass way and he was mad at him and, and he had had that altercation with them in traffic in la and he came on your tv raps and he was talking about it and i was like dude this dude is in incriminating the crap out of himself and that's the infamous me put my hand over Pac's mouth. And if you look at you look at that episode, I'm wearing Carl Kanai, bro. I had met Carl Kanai on the streets of LA. Carl Kanai wasn't even popping like that yet. So mm -hmm. it was like all of us was, you know, all of us was supporting Carl. Pac was supporting Carl. Carl hadn't blown like that. Walk Away hadn't blown like that. Those multi-million dollar companies had not happened yet. We were all just with each other, artists, supporting each other, loving each other, hanging out with each other having fun with each other. And because of Stretch, Stretch brought Pac. Stretch and Pac was like this, dog. And when they made the Tupac story, I was mad that they left Stretch pretty much out of the damn movie. But they was like this, dog. They was like this. And when you saw one, you saw the other one. So Stretch being from around my way, being my guy, signed to our label, but I'm the one that brought Stretch in. Stretch is my dude, was my dude, yo. And that's his man, that's my man. That's how it went. You know, for all the, all the YGs, all the young guns around the way, Stretch was that head. So Stretch co-signed Pac. Pac was everybody's man. Hamo's man, his brother Chris's man, Gam's man. Everybody rolled. We rolled with Pac. Pac was our dude. Mm. So so was, top, was Pac always a while? Because I remember that episode where you put your hand around Pac's mouth. Right. Was that just his 
natural personality or did he just start to change as his star started to rise? That was that was just who he was, man. He was a, to me, you know how people look at X, right? You look at DMX and say, damn, DMX is street, but he's still got this love for God because he's playing on his albums and he's doing, that's Pac, caught between the street dude and the revolutionary. Caught mm. between the Black Panther Party, caught between Keep Your Head Up, Brenda's Got a Baby, Dear Mama, and, you know, everywhere we go, we see the same holes. <laughs> It's a it's a it's a contrast in who he was, but that's exactly who he was. He loved his friends, he loved his family, and above above everything else, he loved black people, bro. He just wanted us to come up and he wanted America to be fair. He was talking about the same thing then that we're talking about now. He loved public enemy. He loved KRS One. He loves consciousness. That's why it had to be some consciousness in his music and some street in his music. It was a battle. That's who he was. That wasn't nothing was play played. Like if Pac got mad, he, there was no shutting him up. You know, it's this funny story that I heard about, and I guess you can elaborate on it because you mentioned all of the key players and meaning Stretch and his relationship with Pac your relationship with Pac, y'all going down to Atlanta for, for Jack the Rapper. It, wasn't there a time where Pac asked you to use your room? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you talking, you know Pac and Stretch, Tretch was like this, right? Yes, Naughty by Nature. Naughty by Tretch. Nature, Tretch, Pac, tight. The dudes are tight, man. Um, so we in Atlanta and we on the rooftop at this well, it came out because when they did the story on Left Eye and, and Andre Rising, they talked about Left Eye and Tupac's relationship, right? So I held back the story because I wanted, I didn't want to be smudge anybody's reputation. So we, I'm at the hotel. I'm staying in. Pac and I'm staying in the hotel across the street. But whatever record company it was, the party was on the rooftop of my hotel. So we sat out there, you know, getting high, doing whatever they do, and I'm already probably high off of one blunt. They smoking like freaking chimneys. And Pac go, yo, man, you staying in this hotel, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, yo, let me get your key, bro. I'm about to go smash. I'm like, oh, you getting ready to go smash? I'm like, who you going to smash, dude? It wasn't nothing for Pac to smash something. I'm like, who you going to smash now, bro? Come on, man. Don't mess my sheets up in my room, bro. For real. If you do what you do, take the sheets off, put them on the floor, and then call him and tell him to bring me a new set of sheets. He's like, I bet. So he said, look, look over there near the door. Look over there near the door where we came up at. He said, no, 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 turn around so fast. Just kind of sneak and look. <laughs> and I look, and it was left eye. And I'm like, yo, you get ready. Boy, son, you get ready to smash left eye. I'm like, here, take my key. Go ahead, do your thing. I'm still up all there partying, mingling, drinking, having a good time. It couldn't have been 20 minutes later where he comes back right back huffing and puffing like yo here and she's behind her Pac, i'm sorry i'm sorry like yo get away from me man now nah, get on man go ahead i told you man go ahead so she kind of gets the message and spins around and walks away and i'm like yo what happened dog i thought you you you, you captain quick with it you quick nut like you, you smashed that already he's like nah man we got down there man and you know we getting into it we kissing and feeling on each other and everything you know so we in your room, man. You got that king size bed. So I'm like, yo, I start, I take my stuff off, jump right in the bed. I'm ready. Like, what's good? And she's like, yo, let me go in and take my clothes off, and you know, and I'll be back. I use the bathroom. And she came back out, and she had on a sports bra and naughty by nature boxes. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think my man found that too sexy. I think he's kind of upset because he's like, yo, you represent Tretch. Tretch, my boy. You want me to hook you up with Tretch? I'll hook you up with Tretch. He's like, I got bad, man. I put my clothes on like a month ahead of <laughs> Yo, Pac was a wild boy. Yeah, like you ain't even got on like no thongs and nothing looking sexy. Like you a female. Like what you doing with naughty by nature underwear on? Like what the fuck <laughs> is wrong with you? <laughs> now, at the boy, time. Man. Was she was she left eye, left eye at that yeah. time? Had TLC blue? It was the it was the creep. It wasn't the uh, uh, waterfalls. It's before but, that. It, it was she creep. Was, it was that first album. Okay, so so that's crazy, sexy, cool. If I if I were, 
Remember that that huge first album. That first album, yeah. She had they hadn't blown, but it wasn't it hadn't happened yet. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It had they were selling some records, but that huh hadn't happened yet. So it was their, it was their first album, yeah. Okay, so so again, you just spoke about the 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 love that you Pac Stretch had, and and you like Stretch and Pac was like this. Where did it go left? Um, how, how how did that relationship break down? After after quad, after the quad shooting. Okay, that, that's when it went well because they felt he felt like there's a few things that were said. The first thing is. After Pac got locked up, Stretch was there at that hotel. Stretch had left, right? Because he's always with Pac. They was writing rhymes together, looking through beats and listening to beats, everything. After the quad shooting, Pac felt the way because he said that Stretch and Madge and them didn't come see him when he was locked up. But they couldn't come see him because you had to have ID, and he ain't had no ID. All right, he's a convicted mm. felon. He couldn't come up there to see Pac anyway. He had no ID. That's number one. And then number two, they were friends. The friendship and that bond was B.I., God rest his soul, Stretch, and Pac. They were all cool, bro. Like, if you've seen the documentaries on Tupac and Biggie, these dudes, were they were tight. So you can't ask somebody to pick a side would you know that what happened to you did not come from that person? You know Big had nothing to do with that. Big actually went back into the studio and got your gun from in the piano that they hit it and put it in his waistband and walked out with all of those cops out there with a gun in his waist, your gun in his waist. You knew that that did not come from B.I. So you actually stretched to choose a sign. And he's like, you my man, and he's my man. You know where this came from. You know who you was messing with that we kept telling you not to mess with. So you know where it came from, bro. So why are you, why are you wilding? But once Pac got into wilding, there was no holding him back. There's no holding him back even with a guy who's his brother, who he knows, meaning Stretch. Stretch was and there big. with him. And big. And, and big. But, but I'm saying when, when Stretch, when Pac got shot, wasn't Stretch standing next to him? Well, they got, they that... laid him down. Yeah, they laid Stretch down too. He was with him. Mm. So he just felt like, look, it's either you're going to ride with me or, or you're you, going to ride with me. You, you, you got to understand that that really, that stuff didn't really come out and really manifest itself crazy until that Vibe Magazine interview and then when, when Suge Knight put the battery in his back. That's when it really started going. So he wasn't dealing with none, nobody from the East Coast. Nobody. And it wasn't long. When did the, the Quad uh, studio shoot happen? 94? Like 94. He was, he was in jail in 95. Then they got him out, right? And then uh, Stretch got killed not too long after that. Hmm. And did Tupac go to Stretch's funeral? No. And that's when him and I had a problem. Because we're both, we are both godfathers to his daughter. We're godfathers to his daughter. And no matter what happens, the one thing that I learned about is respect. There's a moral code, right? You can see, if if you're a fan of movies, you watch The Godfather like me, the dudes that set Don Corleone up came to his funeral. Mm-hmm. Stretch mm-hmm. ain't have nothing to do with what happened to you in, in a quad studio. That was your man. You could have showed up at his funeral. You should have showed up and just paid your respects. Or even if you wasn't coming, you could have sent something to let everybody know that you felt a certain way about this man who was really kind of responsible for holding you down in New York for a long time because of the amount of respect that street dudes in New York had for Stretch. You know what I mean? They knew who, they knew where that dude came from. They knew his pedigree. They knew that cat would bust his guns when it was necessary. They knew that. So you running around with Stretch was like, yo, you can't touch that kid. He with, he with the young guns. He with them Queens dudes. Them dudes is ill. That's stretching a man. You know? Mm-hmm. The same way he had that pass in New Jersey because of Tretch. 
When Pac went to East Orange and all that, Newark, they knew not to touch him because that's treacherous, man. The same way when I was in Jersey and I'm running down there with the double I crew, cats down there knew I was untouchable because I'm treacherous, man. I'm on their block. I'm chilling. I'm with face and all of them. They knew dudes around there was like, nah, they, Ed, y'all don't mess with Ed, bro. Ed's untouchable. That's treach, and that's treach, man. You know what I mean? And from treach, you meet other dudes. You meet dudes, shot callers in Newark and all that that love treach and love Naughty and love Latifah and love all of them. Nah, I walk through Newark, New Jersey, downtown, shop, do whatever I want to do. Go buy weed. If I wanted some weed at the time, I was untouchable because of the love that them cats had for Naughty coming up. Mm -hmm. They love La, don't get me wrong, they love La Tifa, but Nordy was gritty, grimy, North, East Orange. So them dudes had a lot of respect for these dudes that, that came up out of that. So that's the same way they treated Tupac. And Tupac was cool. Tupac was never on no I'm Tupac. He came around and showed everybody love the same way I do. If I'm in the store and there's a bunch of little kids in the store, they going, I'm going to put my money, I'll get what I want, I'm going to pay for what they want. You know what I mean? We, we all on the block. So the same love they had for me, the same love Tupac got shown all around, especially in Queens, New York, because that was, that was Stretch's man. Same love I got shown. It was just all love, bro. So he could have he and he should have shown up to Stretch's funeral. Did Stretch being killed, did it ever come out the why? Did it have anything to do nah, with this? No, it, that was different beef, bro. That's that's a totally different beef. That's some Queens street beef. They ain't had nothing to they ain't had nothing to do with with Tupac. Nothing. Got you. And did, did you ever get a chance to talk to? I mean, Pac is your man. Now you, you you did you ever you, so you got a chance to confront him? Like, how could you not yeah, come to Stretch's I, I, funeral I, yeah. and you the, you the Godfather to his yeah. child? Yeah, I'm gonna tell you one thing that uh, that um, Silk Knight told me one time. When I was living in LA at the time, and a young lady that I was real close with was close with Shug, so I used to go up to go up to death row offices all the time. This is on the waning side of death row. This is probably like '99, early 2000s. wasn't really cracking like that. And I remember he having he had a uh, he had a boat, and he had like this. I think it was Labor Day or something like that. I was there. He had a Labor Day boat ride party, and I'm on the boat with him, and he tapped me, and he go, "You know why I always loved you." And I was like, why? He said, because you, you carry yourself as a man. You're a man. You don't do the rah-rah thing. You came right in the middle of us at the MTV Video Music Awards and screamed on Tupac about not coming to Stretch's funeral, knowing that we could have jumped on you and whooped your ass right there. And a bunch of us wanted, a bunch of dudes wanted to, but I held them off because you came at him like a man. And I told them, I said, yo, bro, that's fucked up. You didn't come to your, you didn't come to our man's funeral. Like, like who does that, bro? What did he ever do to you? Like, mm. that's whack. That's whack for you not to show up to homeboy funeral. We love that dude. That dude loved you. Like for real, for real. Like you playing this game right here, and this shit is dangerous. This is a dangerous game you playing. Cause these dudes not you not the same dudes these dudes are. Mm -hmm. You're not. You're an artist. You ain't the same dudes these dudes are, dog. You running with killers. It's different. Mm. Do 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 you remember the last time you ever saw Tupac? Ah, absolutely. In in the um, in the hotel casino. Right after right after they stomped the dude out, when they was when they was leaving out after police came and all that, they was leaving are, out. You, you, are you talking about the night of the Tyson fight? Yeah. So you was there that night. I was I was right there. I'm in the I'm in the, I'm at the Betty Boop Bar in the MGM Grand where all the where all the uh, pimps hung out at. This bitch mm -hmm. of Don Juan, Pretty Tony, uh, all of them, bro. And I'm chilling with them. We having some drinks. Got a young lady with me, chilling. They laughing, talking about they gonna make me a pimp and they gonna give me a hoe and I got the gift for gal. I'm like, <laughs> I ain't got time for all that. <laughs> I'm laughing with them, just having fun and. Pac and them come through. Pac, the whole crew, shook all of them. They stopped and said, what's up? I was like, yo, what's up, bro? He's like, what's good? He's like, yo, you know, we getting ready to, uh... I was like, what you getting ready to do? He was like, I was like, what happened over there? He's like, I ain't nothing, ain't nothing, man. I was like, oh, there you go getting into some shit again. 
I'm like, what you get ready to do? He's like, we going to Shook's Club, 6'6", six, six, whatever it was called. Yo, you should come through. And I'm like, all right, no doubt I'll come, I'll come through there. But Chris Latimer, who used to do a lot of parties, used mm -hmm. to do Cancun, he had a party that weekend too. And I was slated that same night to host the party that Lat had. So I told him, yeah, man, I'll probably come through. I got this other thing I'm going to do. And I'll probably fall through there after that. And I was like, yo, man, be, take care of yourself, bro. I love you. And he was like, I love you too. And that was the last time I seen him. So you telling me, even after you confronted him and screamed on him for not going to stretch his funeral, right before... Well, we, we hugged right after I said what I said. Because okay. he looked at me and he was like, yo, you know what? I, I love that dude. He's mm -hmm. like, you're right, man. He's like, I was, I was on something, man. I loved him. And I was like, yo, he loved you too. And, you know, he had a tear in his eye and I'm tearing up right now thinking about it. And we just dapped each other up and hugged each other. And, and we took a picture and people got that picture because I had the white hat on and the Versace shirt and cigar. And this fool had two blunts, one in each hand. <laughs> and he had the death row, death row North shirt on because Suge was trying to open up a death row on the East Coast to give bad boys some competition. And we hugged, man. And we took, I think Ernie Panicoli, one of them took the picture. So by the time I seen him again, there wasn't no real beef. And there was never beef between his brother Mo Prem and Stretch's brother Chris. They, it was all love. It, it, this was family, bro. This is just different. This was family. But like I said, if Pac got on to something that he felt strongly about, he was going to stay on it. So mm -hmm. that was a disconnect between him and Stretch, but not Mo Prem and his brother Chris. They were still loved there. Chris was still going out to Oakland working on music and everything like that. So, you know, we hugged, man. We was fam. We was fam. So your last words to Tupac literally I love you. was I, I love, love you. you. Wow. Wow. And, and and they just got into that altercation in the lobby of that hotel. When they saw you at the bar, was they row row? They were or was they were just... still they were moving in a certain manner. And and mm -hmm. I it was me that said, yo, what's good? Pac. And he stopped, he turned around, oh! And it was like, yo, what's good? And it was like, what, what was that, man? Some, don't worry about that shit. I said, there you go, get yourself in some shit again. You know, I didn't know what happened. I and, didn't see it. So that was an exchange of the invitation to over the show spot. And I'm like, mm. you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, eh, I'm from the East Coast. And I go over there, they get drunk. Let's stomp out the kid from the East Coast. He knows puppy. <laughs> you know, I'm like, nah, I'm not going over there. How long was it after that you heard that Pac had gotten shot? I actually saw the car. I didn't know that was the car that he was rolling in. I saw dudes on the side of the road with their hands up behind their heads like that. I'm rolling back and the police cut off all, all the traffic. So me and the young lady, we're in a cab and we're trying to make our move over to where Chris Latimer was doing his thing where I was supposed to uh, host and the police cut off all the traffic couldn't get, the highway was all the way backed up, so it didn't make sense trying to get on the highway and come back around so I could get to the hotel. So I got to the hotel and um, I got the call the next day. Somebody called me and told me that Pocket got shot that night. And I kind of brushed it off, cause it, you know, ain't the first time he got shot. I thought he, mm -hmm. he in the hospital, but you know, what's what's going on with him? You know, there's like, he's, you know, they holding him, he's stable, stable but critical or whatever, however you want to call that. And I thought he would make it. I just knew that he would be okay. I think everybody thought that. It's crazy. Even though you saw the car and you knew something happened on that strip, I didn't know you it didn't was realize. Him. No, I didn't know it. I didn't, I didn't see that until the next day when I was watching huh. the news. I was like, yo, that's the car, shorty, that me and you just passed. But I remember that. She was like, yeah. I was like, damn, that's the car home, homeboy was in. Like, wow. Wow. Did you ever catch, Vlad did an interview with um, one of the guys who was in the car, supposedly, allegedly, in the car that um, shot at Pac. Yeah. Did you ever catch that interview? No, I've, I've heard, I, I have to catch it, but I, what, what do you have to say about it? Uh, he didn't say too much in too much in detail. He did admit that he was in the car that night. Never said who pulled the trigger. But I, I was just wondering if you ever got a chance to really watch it and go through those chain well, of I know, events. I know the biggest rumor is it was the Southside Crips that that popped him. Mm. I know that. 
I know that. And, uh, you know, when they, they dealt with it on that Tupac and uh, Biggie uh, show, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. supposedly came from them to, in retaliation for the stomping out of one of the big dude's nephew is, is who they stomped out. Mm -hmm. So that's what that was supposed to be about. Got you. Speak, speak, speaking of the Mike Tyson fight, did Mike Tyson, do I got this right? Did Mike Tyson ever give you a Bentley? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> so hold on. Before you even, like, like, was you and Mike like this? Like, who just gives somebody a Bentley? Mike, you saw Mike. You was cool with Mike. If Mike said, because we had did your own TV rest with Mike a couple of uh -huh. times. Uh -huh. So if you saw Mike, Mike was your man. You know, me and Mike had a certain rapport. You know, Mike is Mike is my man. I interviewed Mike a few times. Mike is my dude. I ran into Mike in Versace one time. He won't buy me all kind of shit because he in there spending mad money and insisting that I take this. So this is just another time of me being out and running into Mike. So you run, I run into Mike. I'm going to Nell's. Mike is coming out. I'm going in. I parked my car down the block in the parking garage. I'm going in. Mike is on his way out. Mike is telling me, yo, don't go, yo, don't go in that shit's whack. I'm like, yo, that shit's whack? He's like, yeah, I don't know what's up tonight. This shit's just shit terrible. So let's do something else. I'm like, all right, fuck it. I'll roll with you, Mike. What you want to do? My, Mike is like, yo, let's go to that, that uh, Jamaican spot in Queens where all the bitches be at. I'm like, oh, you talking about the Q Club. Bet. Let me go get my car. Nah, fuck that. Ride with me. Get in the car with me. I'm in the car with Mike. We flying. This nigga's running mad lights. I'm hold up, hold Mike, Mike was driving? Mike was driving the car. I'm holding on, this nigga's wilding. We get to the front of the club, we got like, I don't know, man, we may had six, seven cars behind us. Mike jump out, hey, tell a guy from the parking lot, yo, just leave all of these over there, I got it. We get to the door of this Jamaican club with the strictest dress code, bro. They, they dress code was strict. But I'm like, it's the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Who's not going to let Mike Tyson in their club, right? I get to the door. Mike got on like this Sergio Tachini, whatever it was, velvet suit. It's the middle of the winter. He got on this big-ass fur coat. Looked like it cost $150,000 with one big-ass button this big holding the hood on. He's Mike Tyson, you know, felines, the whole nine yards. We get to the door. We walking up. Uh, my man said, yo, man, I, I can't let y'all in, man. You're not, you're not dressed correctly. I said, bro, this is Mike Tyson. Like, what the fuck is you talking about? This the, is this the heavyweight champion of the world. How you not going to let Mike Tyson in your club? So we're standing there in the little foyer part, and there's people on the line that's ready to pay to get in the club. And some girl goes, well, Mike, you need to learn how to dress when you go out. Why did she say that? He starts going the fuck off. I'm going to buy this club. <laughs> Shut the fuck up, bitch. I'll buy this club. I'll fire all y'all niggas tomorrow, right? Hey, fuck they talking to? Pow! I'm like, Mike, stop hitting me, man. Like, this, <laughs> this, your love taps hurt, bro. This is the second time. Don't hit me. So I said, look, man, you might want to call the owner or if the owner's on the premises, you want to tell this dude I'm here, Mike Tyson is here. Because if he find out that you had the undisputed heavyweight champion here and you wouldn't let him in because of some bullshit dress code, you're going to have a lot of problems. So my man disappeared. He come back with the owner. The owner knows me, so I'm like, yo, man, he's like, oh, oh, uh, my bad, Ed. He's like, listen, I got to keep face, so I'm going to let y'all all in the side door of the club. So the guy comes outside, says, how many with me? The last person raised their hand. Follow him. We all get in the club. Now we in the club. Now, to be famous is one thing, but to be uber famous is something else, right? So the DJ sees me. He yells out, yo, Bumba Clyde, head lover in the club tonight. Word up, bro. Throw it up, throw it up. That nigga see Mike Tyson, he stopped the music. <laughs> <laughs> Bumba Clyde, the champ is here. Mike Tyson, people banging on chair. Bow, 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 We get this little section not too far from the DJs. We chilling. Mike said, hey, what we drinking, man? I said, I don't know, Mike. What you feel like, bro? This like this before bottle service. I don't know, man. Get, get, tell the waitress to bring you like 30, 30 40 bottles of champagne. I'm like, I I'm thinking to myself, I hope I ain't got to put in on this shit. I ain't, got, <laughs> I ain't got that kind of money. We get the champagne. 
We drinking, having a good time. I get a chick, I'm against the wall, grinding her down. I look up, I see Mike doing like this. Yo, Ed, come here. Go back over there, I said, Mike, what's up? Yo, go tell the DJ, I got the bar until it closed. I'm looking at my watch, I'm like, it's like two o'clock, bro. This shit don't close at like four o'clock. Like, you, you buying a bar out? Yeah, tell him I got it, don't worry about it. Tell the DJ, yo, Mike is buying the bar out. So everything free till four o'clock, till the shit closed. For everybody in the club, don't matter what it is. Pull the music down, he say that shit, niggas go crazy. You see the surge towards the bar. Everybody want to drink now, because Mike paying for it. Now it's four o'clock in the morning, the club is closed. About 4.15, we outside. Laughing, joking, we all around in the circle, talking shit. Mike, yo, hey, we had a good time. I'm like, yeah, yo, Mike, that shit was crazy. You bought the bar, you seen a man in there with cash to pay the people for the bar? Never seen no shit like that. But yo. Do you remember the do you remember the size of the bill? No, nah, I don't remember. I know okay. his man had his man was doing the Mike was doing Floyd Mayweather before Floyd Mayweather. Exactly. His man had the joint on the back. Ain't nothing in there but cash. You know what I'm saying? If it ain't in there, there's more cash in whatever car, somebody else's car. There's at least a hundred grand around them at all times. Mike goes to send his man in to pay. I'm outside. I'm like, yo, Mike, good time, man. Getting late. One, yo, got to take me back to New York. Let me get the car out the garage. Mike's like, nah, I, I, I can't go back to New York. I got a lot of shit to do tomorrow, Ed. I got to go right to where I'm going. I'm like, well, Mike, have one of your mans or somebody take me in a different car just so I go get my car, man. I got to get my car. Nah, we, I need everybody with me. And he goes, don't your moms live around here somewhere? I'm like, yeah, she don't live too far from here. And he throws me the keys to the Bentley. I take the Bentley back to my mom's block in Queens. I park it on the street. I hit it. Boop, boop. I start walking in the house. Then I'm thinking, hold on. You can't leave this car outside on the street, bro. You got to put it in the garage. But we ain't have no garage. My pops tore it down. So I pulled it into the backyard. Long story short, week go by. I still got this car. Two weeks go by. I still got the car. Three weeks go by, my boys are gassing me out. You got to move this, man. You got you can't just let it sit there. The motor sees up. I don't know nothing about no Bentley. So I'm driving this shit around the hood like it's my car now. I, I had already <laughs> gone and got my car, but I left the Bentley at my mom's house. Because I, I, where I lived there in Jersey, you couldn't take it over there either at the time. So I'm rolling. I got this Bentley. All of a sudden, my pager go off, 911, 911, with a number. See, that's pager days. I call back, go, yo, hey, Ed, this is John Horn, you know, Mike's, I said, yeah, John, I know who you are. Yo, by any chance, do you happen to have one of Mike's cars? I go, yeah, I got that Bentley where we was out the other night. Yeah, I got that. He said, well, give me an address. I'm going to send somebody to come get it. I didn't think none of it. I knew it wasn't my shit. So they came and got the car. Gone. Fast forward 15 years later, I'm in Vegas at Tau. I see Mike come in. He's standing by the bar. Of course, I got to go holler at him. That's my man. I'm talking to Mike. People come up by, hey, champ, how you doing, man? How you doing? Good. How you? Hey, Ed Lover, what's up, bro? Mike goes, Ed, it's been a good life, right? I'm like, yeah, Mike, it's crazy. He said, people still call me champ. Man, I ain't been in the ring in over 10 years. People still call me champ. Yeah, it's been a long time since you're on TV Rats. People still know you. They know everything. So, man, remember we used to go out to Nelv and shit, have a good time and all that. I said, remember that spot we went to in Queens with the Jamaican bitches? I was like, yeah. So remember that night I gave you the Bentley to take to your mom's house? I was like, yeah, I remember that. He said, you know, I gave you that car, right? I said, what? <laughs> he said, no, nah, I gave it to you. you. I wanted you to have that. You was my man, you know, and I knew you couldn't afford a Bentley or nothing like that. So I like having all my friends, you know, be fly. I just, no, I just really want you to have that. He said, John and them came and got that. These jealous motherfuckers, right? I was like, yep. I said, you tell John Horn if I see him, nigga, you owe me 400000 all right? Because this nigga gave me a Bentley and you came and got it. I didn't know it was mine. I, I said, why you ain't tell me? Like, yo, you know I was getting high, Ed. I remember I gave a lot of cars out. I'm like, this nigga. Crazy. Gave me the shit. Crazy. You know, Ed, you, you, again, you had such a fascinating career. You did movies, you did TV, but so many people know you for radio. How did that transition happen to morning radio? Because I know you started at Hot 97 in New York, and then eventually you segued across the street to Power 105. Went from, went what? from, went from Hot 97 to L.A. for two years, and then back into New York to Power 105. Well, Hot 97 happened because they were looking for somebody to give validity to the station when they switched from a dance station to a hip hop station. And Dre and I was all over the place. And we asked that we want to do morning radio. And I was like, nah, I'm good. 
And then my, my, you know, I was like, no. And my manager at the time had been in contact with the program director over there, Steve Smith. And he took a, my manager, Charlie Stett was brilliant. He took a piece of paper and he slid it to me and I said, what's this? And he's like, this is what Howard Stern makes every year. He said, we ain't got a lot longer here on MTV, man. You're going to need to do something after MTV. And Dre already liked radio. So I was like, all right, let's give this, you know, Hot 97 Morning Show a shot. If I work hard, I can possibly put a dent in this kind of money that Howard Stern is getting. I wasn't getting that kind of money at MTV. So for a while, we had Your MTV Raps and the, the Morning Show on Hot 97 bubbling at the same time. Charlie negotiated a great contract with us at uh, Hot 97, and we just started doing morning radio. Mm. And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the immediacy. Because when you're on TV, you can do something, and somebody tell you that you did something funny and it'd be like three weeks before that you taped it or something, you don't even remember like, what they're talking about unless you see it in the edit. With radio, it was the immediacy of coming outside after work and somebody going, yo, y'all were funny as hell this morning. Being a part of somebody's everyday life through radio is different than being a part of somebody's everyday life through TV. Because TV goes in, they edit and all of that. Radio is just us doing, you know, doing what we do and getting that immediate reaction from it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you go out to L.A. after Hot 97. You do two years out there. I left Hot 97 because they wouldn't guarantee my next contract. Is that why you left? That's the only reason why I left. They gotcha. had already, Dre had already, they had already gotten rid of Dre. Lisa G was about to leave. I had been there for a while without Dre and my contract was coming up and I wanted another guaranteed contract. They wouldn't guarantee it. And then Jimmy DeCastro and them came from LA with a, with a, uh, a group called FMAM and they offered me a guaranteed contract. So I took the contract. You know, I was getting into acting and stuff like that at the time. I was bitten by the acting bug after we did Who's the Man. So I was like, hey, L.A. would be just a great place that I can audition, that I can work and do this whole, you know, radio thing. So I opted to leave Hot 97 and, and you know, go to L.A. So what brought you back home? What brought you back to New York? Steve, brother? again, the same guy, Steve Smith. When we was in L.A., I think I was on radio in L.A. for a year and then AMFM sold to Radio One and Radio One brought in Steve Harvey. Okay. And we were let go, but I was still under contract. So they had another whole last year to pay me $800,000. So I was fine with it. As long as I get my check every two weeks, I'm good. Hold um, on, go, go, go backwards for a second. How much money was you making in LA? 800000 a year. Wow. Guaranteed for two years. So that's $1.6 million for two years. So, so you, you literally had a year off. Well, yeah, just getting a check. Sitting home, in making LA, a check. Doing different stuff. Like I was, a ex, I, I was a, in the... In the garage band on Jim Belushi's show, according to Jim, so I'm a recurring character, so I'm working there every two weeks, every three weeks, or whenever they call me. I did Jamie Foxx when I was out there. I did Moesha when I was out there. So it was, you know, there was stuff that was going on. Dre and I did a couple of B movies. So there was stuff that was, that, that was going on. I believe that's during the time I did Undisputed, too. So with Ving Rains and Wesley Snipes. So we was, I was mm-hmm. out there moving, man, working, doing my thing, still getting my check. And uh, right around that, oh, actually worked for Magic Johnson Music for a little while, too. Mm. You know, mm. so right around that time, when that check was rolling out and I knew something else needed to start happening, you know, going through a divorce, which was hard, um, I opted, Steve called me and said, hey, do you want to come back to New York and do radio again? I was like, what's the station? He was like, remember that station jamming 105? I was like, yeah. He said, we're going to flip that into an all-hip-hop station and put some heat on Hot 97's ass. I was like, absolutely. <laughs> no, negotiated the contract. I didn't have no real ties in L.A. anyway. I had friends out there, but, you know, wasn't nothing that was keeping me there. And my kids were already here, my two youngest, and I went through that divorce. I, I, I get to come back, be home, and be close to my kids again and do what I love to do, radio? Yeah, why not? It's a no-brainer. 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 Okay, did they keep you at that salary when you came back? Or yeah. Did you get it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the money was good. This is a good time of life. The money is rolling. This is, this is a beautiful time of life, bro. Absolutely. You know, Steve knew what it was because Steve put me on Hot 97 in the first place. So he knew what mm-hmm. it was. How long was you at Power? Wow. Five, six, maybe seven years. Long time. I'll never get to so, do my 10-year bid like I want to. 
what, what, what was it? Wasn't it? And correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't you have an opportunity to interview Oprah at some point? Yeah, yeah. It, where, where was you at at that time? And, in and the how did that even come? Afternoon. You was in the afternoons. Right. It was a while that they had. They had broke up the morning show. Dre was gone again. Um, different co-hosts with me, and. They came to me and say, we have an opportunity to get Star from Star and Buckwild. And I was like, okay. And they was like, would you want to work with Star and y'all two do a morning show together? I said, Star and I are two different dudes, love them to death, but we're both alpha males. Who's going to lead? You can only be one lead. Mm -hmm. Right? So I was like, nah, which I, no, I don't want to do that, which I got in mind. It was like, you could do afternoons. So I was like, oh, that's easy. You ain't got to be there to a certain time and you still get off in time to go hang out. You know what was going on in New York exactly. at that time. That yep. means I can hang out all night and don't have to worry about getting up early for a morning show. And, yo, let's negotiate the bread. So they negotiated one salary for afternoons and then another salary in case they have to bring me back to mornings because they knew Star and Buck Wild, mm -hmm. anything can happen, right? Mm -hmm. So they were going to gamble on that. But they still kept me under contract for mornings. So I'm doing my afternoon joint. I got people coming through. Jamie Foxx comes through. That's my man. Knew him when I lived in L.A. Hung out with Foxx a lot of times. Did the Jamie Foxx show. Foxx comes through, and he's talking about, and I go, yo, you close with Oprah, right? And he's, That's when all the controversy with Oprah about Oprah don't like rap music, and she didn't include Ludacris when, uh, what was that movie, Traffic? She didn't Crash. Invite, Crash. Right. She didn't invite Ludacris. When they, when they, won, the, when they won the Oscar for Crash. Right, and Ludacris didn't get, she didn't invite Ludacris because of the misogyny and she felt was in his lyrics and all of that. Um, so I said, yo, man, you know Oprah, when you see Oprah and them, tell them to, tell them to fall through. Like, she ain't got to make no appointment. This is Oprah. Just tell her, well, I'm here, bro. Tell her, roll up. And she did. And, that, <laughs> and that's how it happened. Jamie told Gail. Gail and, and Oprah were in town promoting her Legends Ball that she did. And Gail said, she said to Oprah, hey, Ed Lover... Jamie Foxx said, Ed Lover got his show on the radio, and I love Ed anyway, so we should just roll up and do Ed's show. And Oprah was like, all right, let's do it. And they just rolled up. I had no idea she was coming. There was no talk between people about booking her, none. She just rolled up, bro. Mm. Just how it was. She, 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 she rolled in. It was her and Gail, a uh, PR person. And two security, and one came up with her, and the other one stayed down in the lobby. And I, I wasn't dead. I wasn't even in the building, Prez. I wasn't in the building. I left early because my my cousin, the guy I killed in his wake, was that night. And I wanted to go home and, and get myself ready for the wake. I wasn't mm -hmm. even in the building. I was halfway down the block in my truck when they called me and told me Oprah was there looking for me. And I hung up on him the first time. Like, man, y'all play too much. Get out of here. Y'all know I'm, you know, I'm grieving. I got stuff to do. And they called me back. I was like, yo, you need to get back here. Oprah is in this lobby in the green room looking for you. So I jumped out my truck, had my assistant take the truck back and put it back in the garage. And I roll up in there. And she was like, hey, baby, I'm looking for you. <laughs> and we walked right in the studio and sat it down, gave us some headphones. And whatever song was playing, I turned that shit off. Said, we ain't wasting no time. Ladies and gentlemen, you are not going to believe who's here. Oprah Winfrey. And she was like, hey. Wow. Crazy. Everybody wow. in the whole studio came running around to look at me interviewing Oprah. This has got to be one of the highlights of your life. Like, you mentioned a lot of iconic people throughout this interview. Bill Cosby, Mike Tyson, Tupac Shakur. Where does Oprah fit into the grand scheme of your life? Man, right there, bro. Right, right, right at the top of the... Right there, somewhere at the top of the pile because... It, it just, it didn't even stop. It didn't stop from there, man. It was, when she came back to do a live show in New York, we were the only show that she called in to promote the, to promote the joint on. We were the only show that was alive to do the live broadcast from there. She gave me tickets from my mom's and them to come see the show and then came downstairs in the lobby while we was doing the live broadcast to say what's up to me and to give me hugs and give me love. And then went and got my mom's out of line and put my mom's in a better seat. My mom's and mm. her friends in a mm. better seat at the show. And then mentioned me on, on the show. Honey Gail mentioned me on the Oprah Winfrey show. I was like, wow. <laughs>
You know, always, man, always, she cool, bro. She, she mad cool. You had this other, I guess, segment of your life that I don't even know if it was something that was scripted or something that you, you know, intended to do or it came about on the fly, but your whole, come on, man, come on, son. How did that come about and why did it stop? Well, that's, that's a great question. How, how it came about was me. I had just moved into my house and um, I was still on power and I had been reading some stuff on different, on different blogs and stuff. You know, blogs was hot at that time. And there was a story about Jeezy and DJ Drama. And I did my podcast, Drama, and I talked about it. Drama was really the catalyst for, for come on, son. Son is just a word that's been floating around. It's just a New York thing. What up, son? When somebody did something stupid, it was like, yo, come on, son. So I wanted to speak on that and what was going on. And I videotaped myself on my laptop talking about it and whatever else was happening. And I was like, yo, I want, I want to say come on, son, to this. But I don't know how to make something appear below something on the screen, like Chiron it like they did when I was doing the Ed Lover dance and flash it. So mm -hmm. I went and found a box. I hadn't finished unpacking yet. And I took a marker and I wrote, come on, son, on the marker. So I would just flash it for <laughs> when I wanted to say, yo, come on, son, like for real, son, come on, son. And I gave it to my man Nels, who was working uh, for G-Unit at the time. And he put it on disinfifty.com and the hits were crazy, but they was dragging my ass in the comments. So Nelson was like, yo, you gotta do another one, man. But I was like, look, everybody hating on me in the comments. He's like, comments don't matter. They watched it. Mm -hmm. How could they know mm -hmm. to comment on something if they didn't pay attention to it? So you gotta do another one. And that's how Come On Son was born. Yo, shout out to Money Nails. Yeah, shout out to Money Nails all the time. And Come On Son kind of ended when um, I still get people saying you should bring back Come On Son. And eventually I, I lost my editor. I wasn't the one doing all the editing. I had mm -hmm. two different editors and one I lost when, we, when, when Power let me go. And the other one I had and I lost him and I didn't know how to do all the editing by myself. So I just stopped doing it. Got you. You talked about power letting you go. How did it was 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 it a nasty breakup? No. Or, like how did, it was an no, I, not, I didn't I didn't see it happening. Mm. I know I had conversations um with the program director about we gotta change this, we gotta change that, we gotta get younger, we gotta get younger, we gotta get younger. And I was telling him, listen, man, I am what I am. These people have been listening to me for what, 20 something years from Hot 97 to now, I can't reinvent who my age, they know how old I am. And I guess they just wanted to go younger. So I worked and came in one day and after work, I called into the office with the person from Human Resources and told that I was being let go. Oh, wow. And that was that. And the thing that hurt me about it is the way that it was done. Like I had spent so many years on New York City radio in mornings and afternoons you know, I just felt like they should have gave me an opportunity to say goodbye. Like they didn't. Like so they did it. So they did it like like you working at a regular job. They call you in to to told HR. Told me they was going in a different direction. Asked me for my key to get in the building. Told me they would pack up my office and send everything to my house. And all in the same day. Walked me straight out the building, bro, on a Friday. Yep. Ooh, that hurt. So it was no two week notice. No. Mm mm. mm. I didn't know oh, I didn't anything know about the change that was, they kept that under wraps, bro, tight under wraps. I remember walking, going towards the door, walking with the human resource lady and watching women on a sales team that was in sales that I had worked closely with, watching them at their desk crying, crying wow. because I was being let go. Contrary to what, after it happened, all the tweets and all that, oh, your rate, Bro, we was never under top three. Never. My ratings was never under top three in the morning. Never, ever, ever. It was, I think, honestly, bro, I think it was a money thing. I think they just felt like I was making too much money at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when things start getting tight, 
the black guy is always going to be the first guy to go. Mm-hmm. Especially when you're making the, money, the kind of money I was making. I just felt like at the time they figured they could bring in Angela Yee, Envy, and Charlemagne, and collectively they don't have to pay them early when they first got there mm-hmm. what they mm-hmm. were paying me. So that was just it. Okay, we got to get younger, and then Ed's making a whole lot of money anyway. So, Got you. You know, before we wrap this thing let, up. Let, let me I, say one more thing about that, Press. Go, go ahead. This is what bothers me. Elvis Durant, right? Yep. And this is how come I know racism still exists in America. For, 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 just for anybody who doesn't understand Elvis who Durant's Elvis Durant's warnings on Z100. Z100 Cume is 12 plus. Elvis Durant is in his 50s. Why does Elvis Durant still get to keep his morning show? But I was in my late 40s and I didn't get to keep my morning show. So how come it's okay for them to stay and do what they do and talk to 12 plus? I'm talking to 18 to 34, but I'm too old to do my job. Wow. Elvis is white. He's cool with everybody over there, and that love is the black dude that makes a whole lot of money. I believe that in my heart. I couldn't let this interview go by. I had the, and before we wrap it up, I had the pleasure of interviewing your longtime friend, brother, partner, Dr. Dre. And, um, you know, after I interviewed him, I was like, I gotta go and get Ed. So thanks again for agreeing to come on and, and really giving me this opportunity to sit with you. So it's, it's definitely my pleasure. Oh, my. Uh, thanks, for, thanks to Vlad TV, man. I appreciate y'all asking. Absolutely. Question for you. Over the years, has there any bit, I mean, I asked um, Dre the same thing. Because you guys have worked together for so long and been brothers for so long. Has there ever been a fallout between you two? Absolutely. Brothers argue, man. There's, there's, been, there's been a time when Dre and I wasn't talking for a long time, but nobody else would know about it. It wasn't mm-hmm. nothing like, you know, it wasn't nothing that personally happened between us. I, I just think that after Dre got let go and my career continued on power and my career continued through Sirius XM and, my, and I went here, it was just like we just kind of lost contact with each other for a while and just, it was never anything that you can say this is what stopped Ed and Dre from talking to each other. Got you. It was never, it was never anything like that. It was always love between, between Dre and I. I mean, we made history together, bro. Like, Absolutely. How, how can there be anything less than that, than that love? How, how, how did you feel when you found out, because he, obviously Dre's had a lot of health issues as of late. And, um, you know, that could be scary especially for you who've lost so many close people in your life. How did it feel when you found out that Dre lost his leg, lost his eyesight? Because I'm a type two diabetic. I am a blind amputee who's a diabetic. I consider myself to be super bad. That's right, I'm a triple threat now. When I first was um, diagnosed and I first went blind, partly because of diabetes, yes, partly because I had an operation called retinopathy operation where I had laser surgery to fix my retinas. But diabetes is a non-forgiving disease, and it chews away and takes your sight from you. And his, and his health, well, you know, I, I was know, being compromised. I've, I've known about the eyesight for quite some time. It's just okay. something that we, we kept under wraps as, as respect to Dre and what Dre, the way Dre wanted to live his life. So whenever somebody saw me like, yo, how's your man Dre? I always say he's good. You know, mm-hmm. he's doing well. It's in Westbury, he's doing his thing. I never talked about Dre's health issues because it was nobody's business and I was between us, that's, that's family stuff. Um, but when I found out he lost his leg, that, that, really, that really affected me, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? I already knew Dre was, was, you know, was having problems seeing, but for him to lose his leg, that, that, that really, really opened my eyes up to me as a grown man taking better care of myself and for everybody as, you know, black men, we got this thing, we don't like to go to the doctor for mm-hmm. any reason. And just, you know, chilling out and saying, listen, man, get yourself together. You know, you, you, let's make sure Dre's good. You know, I don't want to lose this dude. I got too much history with him. You know, the way I lost Todd and the way I lost Heavy, you know, you know the list goes on and on from Aaliyah to Left Eye to 
all the people pres that you and I know from me going out to LA and doing a thing on Revolt TV with Kim Correct. and then Kim Porter's gone. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we really got to stay on top of our health as as our mental health as well and check on people and to see how they doing from from Garnett, man. Garnett was my man. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So many of us, so, so many, many of them. Man. So when Dre lost his leg, I was like, yo, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure bro is good and to make sure that we get him right back on track to healthy. You know what I mean? Absolutely. One of the things before we end this, I want to I want to make sure and I'll make sure it's in the description. Again, Dre set up a GoFundMe. And, um, you know, I think anybody who came up in hip hop, there's no dollar amount. He's not asking for you to put in $50,000. Anything that you can contribute to his GoFundMe really, really does help. But he made a statement, uh, you know, when I was talking to him and I totally agree with him. He said, look, Sean, I do need this help at this time. And please, whatever you can give from $5 to $5 million. I said, if you go down the list of all the people that we put on your MTV raps, we created more millionaires and billionaires than the United States in hip hop. What's your thoughts on that? I, you know what? I think Dre is one of the contributors to hip hop explosion on the next level. Hip hop mm -hmm. was already a thing, but it was really regional and really kind of national until the Young TV raps came around. And you Correct. know, I, that's why I always reiterate that people don't understand that we had the power of programming. We're the ones that played your videos, right? We're the ones that helped you uh, become international global superstars. So I think if anybody could give back, they should help the brother out. Cause hip hop, we ain't got no union, bro. There's no union, you know? So that's my take and my stance on it. You know, we are gonna take care of the doctor, man. As I think we all should. Ed, I mean, you've given a great, great interview. Thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come and sit and talk with me. Um, you know, I'm sure Vlad is really going to appreciate your candor and just opening up in the Thank way you did. Thank you, brother did. Vlad. So, this ain't the first thing me and Vlad did together, so many more things. Nah, to Vlad told me he used to be a cameraman. Yeah, sir. Um, with, yeah, he, he said he used to be a cameraman from you and um, when you was Vlad, doing Vlad, at, at Power, right? Yeah, Vlad shot the Superhead joint up there at, at Power that he had ended up putting out on DVD. <laughs> that was my, that that's was my a, interview. Yeah. So that, that's a, that's a discussion. Time, you know what this just shows, Prez? It shows that, you know, nothing great is built overnight. Like a lot of people don't know how long Vlad has been doing this to achieve to where Vlad TV is today. Nothing is built overnight. So if you got something, an idea uh, uh, or something that you want to achieve in your life, you got to start and you got to stay at it, stay at it, stay at it, stay at it. The same way I mentioned Carl Kanai. I met the dude on the street. He was selling custom made clothes, took me over to, to where he was at, showed me the stuff that he had the people downstairs in his basement making. I remember when Damon and them first started with the FUBU with the tie dye hats. They believed in that brand and they stayed with it and stayed with it and stayed with it until it became a global phenomenon for everybody. And that's the same way Vlad is doing with Vlad TV. He stayed on it, even when it, you know, the Schmack DVDs and the Vlad DVDs mm -hmm. and all of that went away and he took it and he became digital and he stayed on it. Even when TMZ came behind him and blow up and everybody goes to TMZ, he sticks to his guns and stays on it. And that's what you have to do. Our podcast is Come On Son, the podcast. I've been doing that for four years. I ain't got the mm -hmm. number one podcast in the country, but I'm doing my thing. Podcast, I ain't start making no money to probably this year off my podcast. But if you mm. believe in it and believe in your brand, you stay on top of your brand and you ride it out. And that's what people got to learn. Nothing comes overnight. There's going to be ups. There's going to be downs. Man, that was a time when I didn't know. I wasn't. I, I was out of work, bro. I was. I was at Sirius XM part time, and then had to drive to Philly part time. You know, mm. I, I don't make now what I made back then. But it's a journey. It's a. It's. It is a. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon, and that's true. And I'm just blessed and highly favored, man. I get movie and TV parts and 
I'm a working actor. As soon as this pandemic is over, I'm back to work. And I do stand-up comedy. I go out with my cousin Talon and all of them dudes, man. I'm, I'm working, man. I'm happy. So stay on your grind, y'all. It's real. Just stay on top of your stuff and believe in your brand. I'm not Ed Love anymore. Ed Love is a brand now. There you go. There you go. I love that you said that. That's that's great words. I'm so happy you even threw that in. I love you, brother. Keep doing your love thing. Love you too, Brad. Thank you, brother. Much, absolutely. You be good, Ed. You do the same. Everybody stay COVID-free, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Peace.